Okay, so um, I've been pretty successful here in doing a lot of experiments with Bjorn and George, um, but I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a geophysical laboratory, so I figure you guys did enough experimental talks. So I'm going to talk about granites, and I think pretty much Jesse's the only other person here who would bore you with those. Um, this is a an RGB cathodoluminescence image of a quartz crystal from the Cathedral Peak Granite Diorite. Oh, uh, light. What do I press? Middle, Middle one. Good. All right. Uh, so this is um, a cathodoluminescence image of a quartz crystal uh, from Yosemite National Park. And uh, the variations in blue intensity in the quartz crystal are variations in the concentration of titanium. And you can kind of envision that this crystal may have grown from this interior core region outward toward the rim. And uh, so today I'm going to focus on trying to use these variations in titanium concentration um, to determine how these granites formed. And um, maybe can hopefully convince you that they formed uh, really low temperatures. Um, so before I get to that, I'm going to start with a, a little introduction to modern problems in granite. Um, many people think that granites are figured out. I don't think we even have a clue. Um, and what I'm the surprising conclusion I hope I can convince you of is that granites and granitic mineral assemblages can crystallize from a fluid at temperatures hundreds of degrees below the traditional wet solidus or, or the low temperature limit that we think of for granitic rocks. Um, and then at the end, I'll do some arm wave zircons um, in the global detrital zircon record. And I just wanted to highlight this because um, most of these zircons crystallize from granitic melts. And you can see that the beginning of the earth is over here. and Quite rapidly after that, we have crystallization of zircons from granitic melts. Um, and what this means is that granites and granitic rocks have been around for billions of years. Um, and granites and the related mineral assemblages uh, can actually tell us quite a bit about the evolution of the Earth. Um, and so this is a, just a thin section image of a quartz crystal from the Hadean. This is a Hadean age quartz, or, sorry, Hadean age zircon crystal from uh, the Jack Hills Meta Conglomerate. So, so what we can do and what my colleagues and I are working on is coming up with metrics using modern granitic rock to try to understand um, the temporal and secular evolution of the crust uh, through these mi old mineral assemblages. Um, another big issue that we're working on, uh, this is some of my master's work, is trying to understand the relationship between granitic and volcanic rocks. Um, rocks that simil have almost identical bulk composition formed through very different processes. Um, one of the big problems right now is the relationship between high silica rhyolites like the Bishop Tuff um, and their granitic uh, counterparts. Uh, so there's been this idea for a while that high silica rhyolites are these um, explosive volcanic eruptions that form um, and the residual is left somewhere down in the granitic residue. Um, some people think that they form uh, the residues are aplites, which are these fine grained um, late stage veins that occur in granites. Um, but if you look at the rare earth element signature of these, for example, um, they're very different. So we uh, come up with the notion that these rocks actually form through different processes. But we're using these and other techniques to try to understand um, the relationship between volcanic rocks that explode uh, from the crust and plutonic rocks that just kind of cool um, slowly through the crust. Um, but to step back and um, try to answer an even more fundamental question about granites is, what are the conditions at which they form? What are the temperatures and pressures and um, compositional evolution of granites that we, uh, that we can look at? And this is, most of you probably know this, this is Half Dome Granite Diorite, um, very famous rock from Yosemite National Park. Um, and like I said earlier, I, I think that um, these rocks formed hundreds of degrees below where people have previously thought for the past 50 years. Um, and so, the reason that most of us think that granites formed at around 700 degrees or maybe a little lower is due to work that was done primarily here at the geophysical laboratory, or at the old geophysical laboratory, um, by some of the fathers of experimental petrology, Tuttle, Bowen, and Shirer, and others. Um, and so this image, this is a familiar uh, figure for anybody who's taken a petrology class. This is the quartz albite orthoclase ternary diagram. Um, so up at the top here, it's pure SiO2. The bottom here, it's pure sodic feldspar and pure potassic feldspar. And these curves are cotectic curves. 
Um, and so basically, um, if you're at five kilobar, 0.5 kilobars, um, this curve represents the uh, low temperature, uh, the low temperature end of the melting. So, for example, if you um, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide. So, um, what I've draw done here is drawn a dashed line through um, that low temperature point right here, um, and put that onto this figure. So this is zero percent quartz and hundred percent quartz, and temperatures going up in this direction. So if you started at a bulk composition right around here, at a high temperature, you start with all melt. Um, and you can cool that until eventually you hit this liquidus surface and start crystallizing quartz. And the bulk composition of that melt evolves down to this point, which is the cotectic or eutectic minimum. Um, and so what this means is that the last melt in that system will crystallize at this uh, eutectic composition. Um, and so again, so this is uh, for 0.5 kilobars. This is that low temperature composition point, and the temperature, the compositions evolve toward higher pressures down here to four kilobars. Um, and then so what uh, Tuttle and Bowen and Shira and others did was they took this global composition compilation of granitic compositions and plotted it against this, um, and they noticed that the compositions of the granites formed almost identically on top of these uh, last last melt compositions um, that they saw in their experiments. And so what they interpreted was that the granites, or the magmas that form the granites, crystallize from near eutectic melt um, at this eutectic point, um, also known as the solidus. Um, so below the temperature, as I formed that here, uh, it's just just minerals, no melt. And uh, so another way to look at this, this is um, just an obscenely simplified version of how magma forms. Um, but if you start, so now I've got temperature right here, pressure right here. If you start, say, at this point one, um, you're uh, higher in temperature than um, any of the minerals are crystallized, so you start with just a, a pure molten system. And if you decrease the temperature, eventually you're going to hit a mineral in boundary. Um, so once you hit this temperature, you're going to start crystallizing quartz. Um, and then if you continue to crystallize, continue to decrease the temperature, you're going to continue to crystallize quartz. Um, and eventually you're going to hit the plagioclase in boundary and the potassium feldspar in boundary. And then this red curve right here is the wet solidus. So this is for uh, granitic magma that's saturated in free water. Um, and so once you hit this temperature, you're going to continue to crystallize that mineral assemblage, and then you can go down temperature. But um, two important things from this, again, overly simplified version of a granite, is that the minerals will, re will record a protracted thermal history. So the quartz crystallizes from all the way out here um, to the solidus. And again, uh, we predict no crystallization below the solidus temperatures, all right? And so if you look at the mineral record in granites, these are all images of crystals from uh, Yosemite National Park. Uh, this is that crystal I showed earlier. Uh, this is a barium zoning in a potassium feldspar megacrist, a very large crystal of feldspar from Cathedral Peak. And this is zoning familiar to many of you uh, in zircons from these rocks. And so, you know, what this is showing is that these rocks do, in fact, record protracted thermal histories. Um, you can also see that the history is a little bit more complicated than um, that diagram I showed earlier. Um, this boundary right here is a resorption feature, so this quartz crystallized outward, um, started melting, and then started recrystallizing. Uh, you can see features like that throughout the crystal, um, in both the quartz and the feldspars and the zircons. Um, but in general, the crystallization crystallization histories are recorded in these minerals. Um, so I'm going to try to use that to understand how these rocks form. So the main question I'm going to try to answer at the beginning here is, what are the conditions at the wet solidus? So I'm just going to go back here. So what I'm trying to figure out is, what are the conditions at this very late stages of melt? So what are the temperatures and pressures that these rocks form at the very last stages? Okay, um, And then of course, naturally following that is what are the temperatures, at what temperatures do granitic minerals crystallize? Um, and I'm going to come up with some results that are um, atypical, um, and so I'm going to try to describe or explain them to you. Um, so the location I'm going to here is the Tuolumne Intrusive Suite. Uh, this is in the Sierra Nevada, so we've got California over here. This is an inset. Um, the Tuolumne Intrusive Suite uh, is one of these large compositionally zoned granitic basilisks that make up the spine of the Sierra Nevada. Um, the rocks, so this is the Glen Allen tonalite right here, which is uh, from right around here. 
And so you can broadly see that the rocks go from darker to lighter. So they're more mafic on the rims, going toward more felsic in the cores. But there's also protracted thermal history recorded in these rocks. So the Zircon uh, CAID Tim's ages go from 95 to 85. So these rocks crystallize over over 10 million year period, um, and they age, they young inward. Um, so why the Tuolumne Intrusive Suite, aside from the obvious fact that it's beautiful rocks? Um, it's a well-characterized suite, so this is perhaps the, the best studied suite of granitic rocks um, in the world, um, probably due to beauty and access and proximity to uh, the West Coast and universities. Um, again, there's a wide compositional variability from tonalites, mafic tonalites out here to um, porphyritic granites in the center. Um, it's relatively undeformed, which is important for me. Um, a lot of granitic rocks can undergo a lot of deformation on their way to the surface, and that'll wipe out any sort of chemical signatures that I'm looking for. Um, so they, they basically are pretty pristine, not a lot of shearing, not a lot of metamorphic deformation. And then, and then the big thing here is that these are um, magnetite series calc alkaline granitic rocks. Um, and to translate that, this is basically how crust is made. Um, this is the primary mechanism by which crust is made, continental crust is made today and um, into you know, the past couple billions of years, in my opinion. So the, these rocks are, are the hallmark of crustal growth um, today and in the past. So I'm just going to pepper you with a couple of pictures before I get to thermodynamics. Um, this is Half Dome back here. This is from Olmsted Point. Um, all the rocks in this image are granites, and all of them are from the Tuolumne Intrusive Suite. So it's a large, massive volume of magma. Um, for those of you who have uh, Max, you'll you'll notice this with the L OSX El Cap, um, and then that little piece of El Cap that fell off last week or maybe two weeks ago was from right around here. Um, and then if you're into Hudson River School art, there's a lot of beautiful examples of that. Again, it's this access thing. People just love to go walk around this valley and draw it or take pictures of it. Um, so anyway, so what I'm going to use, again, is the titanium concentration from quartz, but I'm going to use three different techniques. I'm going to use titanium and quartz thermal barometry, um, CL imaging, so those cathodoluminescence images I showed earlier. And using those CL images, I'm going to extract titanium concentration gradients and do some diffusion modeling. Um, and I just wanted to point out here, um, all of these techniques, although they all use titanium and quartz, are, are independent of one another. So the CL imaging, the diffusion modeling, is completely independent of the titanium and quartz thermal barometry. Um, so if my results converge, that's a good thing for me. Um, so titanium and quartz thermal barometry, this is the most experimental that this talk is going to get right here. Um, this is work that was done by my collaborators at RPI. So the basic idea is that if you grow quartz, in equilibrium with root seal in an experiment, um, you can get an expression that relates the activity of titanium and quartz in root seal to this equilibrium constant. Um, this is basically just one, and so this is what we're concerned with, and we can call that this XTIO2 in quartz, um, put that into an expression for the Gibbs free energy, and, and that gives us um, a framework um, that we can expect. So if we grow a quartz crystal at a temperatures, range of temperatures and pressures, We'd expect it to fit this, um, this form right here. And so what you can see is these are titanium concentrations on the y-axis versus reciprocal temperature on the x-axis. And if we go up here to 10 kilobars, um, you can see that as you increase temperature, you increase the solubility of titanium and quartz. And as you increase pressure, you decrease the solubility of titanium and quartz. And so we can fit this, we can fit this set of data um, uh, to an equation that relates the titanium concentration in quartz to temperature, pressure, and uh, titanium activity. Um, so what I'm going to do is go to this wet solidus curve. This is that red curve I showed earlier. Um, and so above this in temperature space, we have melt plus crystals. Below it, the material is entirely crystalline. This is the assumption I'm working with. Um, and so with that assumption, uh, the quartz rims should record the solidus. So basically what I'm saying is that these quartz crystals are growing outward in a magma or a melt or what have you, and the last gasps of that material, the solidus, is going to be recorded at the, cr the rims of that quartz crystal, okay? Um, and then what I'm going to do is, so now I have this curve in temperature and pressure space. So take those temperatures and pressures, put them into this expression for the solubility of titanium and quartz, um, assume a titanium activity, um, 
and then I'm going to get, and then you get this curve. Okay, so basically what I did for every temperature and pressure along here, put them into this equation, and now I'm relating temperature and pressure, which are fixed to each other on the x-axis here, and titanium concentration. All right, so this is the anticipated titanium concentration on the rim of a quartz crystal. So ideally, if I went to a quartz crystal in a granite anywhere on Earth, um, and I measured, say, 100 ppm's titanium, and I m had a good constraint on titanium activity, I could go over here and get a temperature and pressure at which that rock formed. I thought this was a pretty good idea, but it doesn't really work, as you'll see. Um, so anyway, so this is for an assumed titanium activity of 0.5. Um, if we had rutile present in the system, we can just say, great, we think that these formed in equilibrium with a TiO2 phase, so activity is 1. Um, unfortunately, most granitic rocks don't contain um, a quality TiO2 buffer. Um, so what we need to do then, so what I've done instead is contoured that same figure. So the yellow curve here is this curve, all right? And I've just contoured this for a range of titanium activities. Um, and now this looks pretty complicated, but what I'm going to do is constrain. At this point, I want to determine temperature, so I'm going to try to constrain pressure and titanium activity to come up with a range of expected titanium concentrations on the rims of crystals. All right. Um, so estimating temperature pressure in ATIO2, uh, we have a, some reasonable constraints on pressure from metamorphic mineral assemblages and contact with these rocks, um, as well as um, aluminum and hornblende, this thermal barometry. And there's quite a bit of spread in the data, but actually this calibration is not that sensitive to it. So I'm going to say these rocks crystallize at around two kilobars. You know, I could say plus or minus, you know, one, two kilobars. It's not going to make much of a difference. Um, and then the, the big unknown here is titanium activity. And so most people, when they look at these rocks, uh, they have these beautiful um, titanite crystals, which is CaTaSiO5. It's a titaniferous phase. And so you know, we just make the assumption that these things are buffered at a relatively high titanium activity. Um, I'm going to use a very conservative estimate here of 0.5 to 0.6. Most people would suggest that it's 0.8. Um, but uh, this this will give this gives me the best shot at my data matching um, the expectation. So okay, so with that two kilobars plus or minus maybe a half kilobar, um, and the 0.5 to 0.6 titanium activity estimates, um, I get this range of expected titanium concentrations at the rims of the crystals. Okay, so it's somewhere between 130 and 230 ppm is, is what I would expect to see on the rims of a quartz crystal if it crystallized at the granitic wet solidus. All right, now I'm going to actually go and measure the titanium in the quartz and see what happens. All right, so the analytical technique we use, this is just a um, sodium is blue here, potassium is green, calcium is red, um, and this is just a big black quartz crystal. Uh, so basically what we did on the microprobe here is measured the rim concentrations in titanium in the quartz, and we did some core-to-core, -core, rim-to-rim and core-to-rim transects to see uh, the evolution of titanium concentration in the quartz crystals. Um, the microprobe here is an amazing machine, so we can actually get uh, detection limits of 0 0.6 to er, 6 to 8 ppm's titanium, um, which is uh, which is very useful for this. I don't have to use any other techniques. Um, so some of the results. All right. So I was expecting to see 130 to 230 ppm's in the quartz. So I, I sampled uh, all across the Ptolemy intrusive suite. Uh, these are just some uh, examples of some of the profiles I ran. And I've put a gray bar here at 20 to 40 ppm. So I don't know if you can see that all the way in the back. I apologize. But the takeaway here is that the rims of these crystals um, pretty much unanimously record uh, titanium concentrations of 20 to 40 ppm, maybe even lower. All right, um, so 20 to 40 ppm. So if I go back to this figure, I'm expecting 130 to 230. I have 20. Um, so on a first order basis, um, the quartz rims did not crystallize at the solidus. Uh, and, and if you plug this into this uh, titanium solubility equation, we actually get out temperatures. Um, we're expecting maybe 690 to 700 degrees Celsius. And you get temperatures at 470 to 550. So 200 degrees lower than has been thought possible for granite for the past 50 years. Um, so that's kind of a bold statement. So I wanted to check that with other tools. Um, and, and also, it's, it's, you, know, you could argue that this might not be a surprising result for the rims of crystals 
uh, because we know that these granitic rocks are interlaced with these are little apolite dikes, those apolites I was talking about earlier. Um, and these are ubiquitous throughout these rocks. So apolites and pegmatites are ubiquitous to these rocks. Um, and it's been pretty well demonstrated uh, in the literature that these things can form at you know, 500 to 550 degrees. So if these are late stage melts forming into granites, why not just have late stage interstitial melt recorded on the rims of quartz crystals? Um, so that is a, a surprising statement, but um, the next big question is, how pervasive is that? Is this just a rim, late stage phenomenon, or is this a, is this a feature that's actually being characterized throughout the entire um, crystallization of quartz? Um, so one of the limitations of using the microprobe here is that we need pretty big spot sizes, and we hit it with a big beam current. Um, and so we have, uh, these are just a couple of uh, secondary electron images of what happens to the quartz crystal when you hit it with a 200 nanoamp beam. Um, so we have large spots, so the spatial resolution is not great. Um, long analytical times, 12 minutes or so a spot. Um, and, and importantly, you know, if, if I'm assuming a titanium activity in these crystals, it's easy enough to say that the rims of the crystals were in equilibrium with titanite crystals. Um, but when you, once you get inside the crystal, there are, um, as far as I've seen, no titanite inclusions in quartz crystals, no titanium activity buffering phases within the crystals. Um, so it's difficult to actually make that assumption of a titanium activity. So without an ATIO2 constraint, it's very difficult to say anything inside these crystals. Um, so what I'm gonna do then is use these CL maps that I was talking about. So this is just a full wavelength uh, visible light CL scan um, from the microprobe here. So each pixel that we get on our maps has one of these full wavelength CL, um, CL scans. And the intensity of this blue, this 452 nanometer peak right here, is directly in proportional in quartz to the titanium concentration. Um, so the more intense that peak, the higher the titanium concentration. Um, so what I can do then is bin all of these C CL maps, every pixel bin for a 452 nanometers, um, and get out an image like this. Uh, so this is, um, I've just con colored this with cyan. This is, um, again, a ti titanium concentration map in these crystals. Um, so you can see again a core here and the outward crystallization. Um, and so what I'm gonna try to do is use these uh, concentrations and the concentration gradients to do some diffusion modeling. And this allows me to do it at a much higher spatial resolution than I can have with a microprobe. So this is that quartz crystal I showed earlier. Um, again, core, outward to rim. If you zoom in here, um, the image got a little pixelated when I converted to a PDF, I apologize. But, but you can see that there are, you know, even just within the small region, maybe three, four, five concentration gradients that I could use to do some diffusion modeling in this. So as an example, I'm just gonna take this um, concentration gradient right here. So I then take the 452 nanometer intensity um, across this boundary and you get a little titanium concentration gradient, all right? Um, so what I'm gonna do next is use these titanium concentration gradients um, and try to fit some diffusion models to that data. Uh, so the diffusion model I'm using is a non-steady state uh, diffusion equation for spherical geometry. Um, in this case, I'm starting with a crystal with a radius of two millimeters, um, and I have an internal concentration at normalized at 100 and an external concentration normalized at zero. Um, and then let this cool at different initial temperatures and cooling rates um, to see uh, what we would expect for our titanium concentration gradient. Um, so on the right here, this is uh, diffusion profiles done with a constant initial temperature. So I started at 690, um, 690 degrees Celsius and cooled at different cooling rates. So you can envision a granite sitting there it crystallizes and then it cools slowly in the crust. All right, this is, this is the model I'm working with. So if we start with this initial step function concentration gradient at the solidus at 690 to 700 degrees and we cool at different cooling rates, uh, we know for most materials that diffusion happens more rapidly at higher temperatures. Um, so if we cool more slowly, let's say seven degrees C per million years, um, it's going to be at higher temperatures for longer, so you're gonna get more diffusion. And so you're gonna have a more relaxed diffusion profile. If you cool more rapidly, let's say 300 degrees C per million years, um, you're gonna have less diffusion because it's gonna spend less time at higher temperatures, so that profile will be less smeared out. 
Um, we can do the same thing for a constant cooling rate. So in this case, I'm just showing a 10 degrees C per million year cooling rate um, with different initial temperatures. So this one right here, the 700 here, this is starting from 700 degrees and letting it cool at 10 degrees C per million year. And this is the profile we would expect if we s crystallize it from 500 degrees and cool at 10 degrees C per million years from 500, we get this, we get much less diffusion um, and that's the profile I'm going to get. So I'll take those PL map intensity profiles that I had earlier and put that on these, uh, on these, on these uh, models. Uh, so these are just two examples. These are two example concentration gradients um, from these rocks, but it's pretty much the same thing everywhere in these rocks. If you see a concentration gradient, this is basically what they look like. Um, and so this is again for the constant initial crystallization temperature and different cooling rates. You'll notice that even for extremely fast cooling rates, 300 degrees C per million years, that's an order of magnitude higher than the average estimate for cooling of these systems. Um, it doesn't even come close to matching the concentration gradients uh, that we observe in the rocks. Um, and over here, constant cooling rate, different initial temperature. The only way I can get the concentration gradients to match the models is if I have a cooling rate, if I start at an initial crystallization temperature of around 500, 550 degrees C, um, which is exactly what we got from the titanium and quartz results, um, which is made me happy. Um, so, and this goes for cores, rims, anywhere in the quartz crystals. These are the concentration gradients I see. The only way they match the diffusion models is from an initial low temperature. Can't cool these things fast enough from high temperatures to retain these uh, chemicals in ocean. All right, so to summarize these titanium and quartz results, multiple lines of evidence, uh, independent lines of evidence, demonstrate that the quartz, almost all the quartz, crystallized at temperatures below where we thought possible for granitic rocks since Tuttle and Bowen. Um, so then this begs the question, well, I guess all this data could be wrong for quartz, but are there other indicators of low temperature within the mineral assemblages? So I'm going to go back to, this is again that barium zoning and potassium feldspars uh, from the Cathedral Peak granite diorite. <coughs> and again, this is that PL zoning that I saw in the quartz crystals. I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that these textures are very similar. Um, you have resorption and recrystallization throughout the entirety of these uh, uh, case bar megacrysts. Um, same patterns here, resorption, recrystallization in the quartz. Um, these are texturally almost identical and these are from the same exact hand sample. All right, so if you look at the comp compositions of the feldspars in these rocks, the potassium feldspars are very potassium rich and the uh, plagioclase feldspars are very uh, albite rich. Okay, so if you look at this feldspar ternary, this is a confusing plot. Um, this was done by my master's advisor. But basically, this is the feldspar solvus right here. Um, so at these low temperatures, you can kind of predict where the feldspar compositions will be. And as you get to lower temperatures, you expect the case bars to be more potassium rich. And that's exactly what we see. So the case bar, the feldspar mineral assemblages in these rocks record temperatures um, around 400 degrees Celsius. So kind of even lower than what I'm getting with titanium and quartz. But I will say that. Um, the slope of the solvus curve is relatively steep, which means that the pres the temperatures are kind of, uh, uh, you can get a, a wide range of temperatures over a very small compositional gap because of the steepness of the solvus curves. So this could easily be uh, 400, 500, 300 degrees without too much fussing. Um, anyway, so the feldspars record very low temperatures. Um, delta delta plots for quartz versus zircons. This is Jade Star Lackey's work on these same rocks. Again, you know, they get these temperatures of, you know, 600, maybe 500 degrees. Either way, below the solidus. Um, so to summarize the results so far, um, quartz and the feldspars, which make up over 85% of these rocks, crystallize 200 degrees below where we thought possible. Um, so the next obvious question is how the heck does that happen? Um, but I'm going to stop and, you know, here's a little applications and implications section. Um, there are a lot of implications for this, um, including maybe the relationship between magmatic and hydrothermal systems and ore deposits. Um, recently, um, Ruben et al. from uh, UC Davis did some modeling of uh, lithium zoning and 
zircon crystals from an arc magma and show that those th that they think that those rocks crystallized the spent the majority of their time at really low temperatures. So this could be a good way to link um, the crustal roots of magmatic systems that are expressed on the surface, um, volcanoes and plutons. Um, this F influence estimates of heat production, um, interpretation of geophysical data. If all your rocks are just sitting there at 600 degrees, 500 degrees, um, crystallizing still, that, that's, a, that's a big difference from what we thought. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of possible reasons for these low temperatures, and I'm going to end with this thermal migration model. Uh, for those of you who are here during Craig Lundstrom's talk a couple months ago, um, this is his model, and it is, I think he would agree with me that this model is under construction at the moment. Um, but this is some pretty new stuff. So uh, first, I'm going to go through um, possible metamorphic processes that could cause this um, magmatic hydrothermal alteration, undercooling. Um, so metamorphism kind of makes sense because <coughs> if you have a granite that crystallizes, finish cr finishes crystallizing at 690 to 700 degrees, it's then going to be sitting in the crust at high temperatures and pressure for presumably millions of years. Um, that's basically just metamorphism right there. It's just solid state metamorphism. So you you could you would actually expect to see a little bit of metamorphic recrystallization of these rocks. Uh, so this is um, a CL map from Frank Spears' work on some, uh, some metamorphic rocks from um, the Northeast. And you can see this kind of um, wormy texture in the CL signal. And, and I actually do see a little bit of that in these quartz crystals from these rocks. Um, so you can see these textures are very similar. So this is just solid state metamorphic growth of quartz. Um, but this is pretty rare. If I was going to be very generous, um, I'd give this maybe a 10% of the volume of quartz. It's probably more likely 1% to 2% of the volume of quartz records these uh, solid state metamorphic events. Um, so that's not a real contributor to these low temperatures we're observing. Um, another idea, this is kind of goes back to, harkens back to the granitization um, versus magmatism controversy that Tuttle and Bowen are mixed up in 60 years ago. It was the notion that you can just um, recrystallize these rocks entirely through um, uh, kinetic recrystallization. Um, so for something like this, where we have this uh, clearly defined crystallization um, patterns in these rocks, you'd expect that, you know, at the very least, you'd have smearing of these boundaries when you have kinetic recalibration. So, you know, if you ha let this thing sit for a while and diffuse, you get you know, some sort of smeared boundary like this. We don't, we don't see anything like that. These rocks are beautiful. The uh, zoning is pristine, and, and for all intents and purposes, it is magmatic crystallization. It's crystallization from a fluid. Um, so don't really see any of that. Um, another possibility, um, which is often invoked in the literature, I think for lack of uh, better models, uh, is the notion that these things could have just gone undergone complete um, subsolidus hydrothermal alteration. So the rocks crystallize, and then you just pump them full of hot water and completely recrystallize the granites. Or at least, you know, at least in the literature, if somebody in the past has gotten these subsolidus temperatures, they just say, oh, you know, hydrothermal alteration. And, and we'll just leave it at that. But, you know, the rocks, it's, it's quartz and feldspar. Um, there's not really any evidence of these kind of typical hydrothermal processes. You, you could expect some maybe albitization of the feldspars, um, quartzization of the uh, micas. There's nothing like that. I mean, the mineral assemblages are exactly like what you see in experiments um, and volcanic rocks, just low temperatures. Um, undercooling, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend too much time on undercooling, um, uh, but this is the idea that is most, well, is readily accepted for the formation of pegmatite, uh, this big crystal, um, coarse crystalline material and appellates in granitic rocks. So the idea here is that if you, um, cool system too rapidly um, in the presence of fluxing elements, you can actually suppress the crystallization temperatures to a couple of hundred degrees. Um, again, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but it's really hard to kind of invoke this type of mechanism when we're talking about magmas that are the scale of the, these rocks. They're large. Um, they have protracted crystallization, period, protracted crystallization and they have experienced a lot of thermal pulsing. Um, so I'm going to rule that one out for now. And I'm going to end here, again, with this thermal migration model. Um, I don't have a good answer yet, but this is the best that I can think of so far. So again, back to these 
old school experim experimental petrology diagrams. Uh, this is again that low pressure quartz two feldspar diagram. And we have these minimum melt compositions at these low solidus temperatures. If you go to higher pressure, you have the same thing. Um, although you end up evolving this into uh, eutectic curves right here instead of just cotectic curves. And again, in any, in any way, any way you go about it, no matter how you crystallize in this system, you're going to go down to these eutectic compositions and these eutectic solidus temperatures. In these diagrams, the ratio of the alkalis to the aluminum is fixed everywhere in the diagram. And Tuttle and Bowen did that very intentionally, as I'll show in a second. So again, the alkali to aluminum ratio in the albite and the orthoclase is fixed. So that anywhere in this diagram, you're going to be crystallizing from a melt where the alkali to aluminum ratio is fixed. Um, so in the same study that developed this plastic ternary diagram, um, Tuttle and Bowen also did experiments where they allowed the alkali to aluminum ratio to vary. So again, quartz up at the top here, SO2. But instead of being constrained to this alkali aluminum ratio, they allowed the alkali aluminum ratio to vary. And what they ended up seeing was they could crystallize along a cotectic curve down to temperatures of 350, 400 degrees. And this is for potassium. You get the same thing with sodium. Um, so the basic idea here is that if you crystallize from a melt or a, a hydrous fluid that's peralkaline, you can crystallize to really, really, really low temperatures. Um, and if anybody's interested later, I can tell you, I think, kind of the politics behind ignoring this pretty important diagram in their um, seminal 1958 memoir. Um, so anyway, so what Craig did with this thermal migration model is say, okay, well, we'll start with the peralkaline melt, um, but how can, you, how can you generate a peralkaline melt in a granitic system when you're crystallizing mineral assemblages that have fixed alkali aluminum ratios? Um, so what he did, and I don't even know if he showed this in his talk, they took an andesite, which is the bulk composition of the continental crust, and because experimentalists can kind of do this, they did this classic cook and look where they put it in a huge thermal gradient from 950 to 350 degrees C and let it sit for a couple weeks. Um, and what they noticed is that you get um, at the cold end down here, you crystallize quartz um, and the two feldspar assemblages that you exact the exact compositions that we see in these granitic rocks um, in the presence of a water rich peralkaline melt. So instead of thinking about this as um, a magma that's silicate rich with some water in it, this is actually a single phase hydrothermal silicate fluid, um, not your traditional magma. Um, so basically what they did is they recreated the entire crustal column in one experiment. Um, I don't think Craig would say this, and I'm certainly not going to say this. I don't think that's how the crust works. It's not just one gigantic thermal gradient that just sits there and does its thing. Um, but it, it actually provided a nice framework for trying to conceptualize some of the ways that these granites could form at low temperatures. Um, so. The thermal migration requires a water-rich system, so this is not going to happen if you don't have a lot of water around. Um, you need long-term crystallization because this does, in some effect, rely on diffusion across thermal boundaries, um, or thermal gradients, and you need sustained thermal gradients. And I, I'm going to argue that the Tawaimi and Trusa suit perhaps best, perhaps best exemplifies these kinds of criteria um, for thermal migration. So to go back to the Tawaimi and Trusa suite, We've got protracted crystallization, so 10 million years of zircon crystallization ages, and that's just one mineral. Um, so we've got 10 million years of protracted crystallization in these rocks, so hits that criterion. Um, this is uh, from, modified, I modified this from Bateman and Staffel. This is kind of an outmoded idea for how magmas form, um, where you have a large pulse of magma being ejected into the crust, and it cools. And you have another large blob of magma being injected interior to that, and it cools. And eventually, you do something like this and form the Tawaiimi Intrusa suite. Um, either way, this is sy system wide thermal pulses with repeated magma injection. The, the reason I'm saying this is outmoded now is that most of us think that these rocks form through much smaller volumes of magma emplacement. So, this incremental emplacement model, as opposed to large, you know, hundreds of cubic kilometers of material being injected into the crust at once at low temperatures. You know, you can do this same thing through very small volumes of episodically um, injected magmas. <coughs> so, you know, if you do thermal models on this, this is from Valium and Medi's 2010 work. Um, this is on the Bateman and Schapel model. Um, so this is 0 MA, 1 MA, four, uh, 4 million years, sorry. And you can see that you're going to have sustained thermal gradients 
across this entire intrusive suite for millions of years. Um, and again, this is this kind of end member scenario where we have large volumes of magma coming in. If it's smaller volumes of magma that are being injected, you're going to have more sustained and, and larger numbers of thermal gradients. So lots of thermal gradients over which you can increase the peralkalinity or paraluminosity of a melt. Um, but anyway, regardless of the model, um, multiple lines of evidence, independent lines of evidence from quartz, from the feldspars, um, suggest that these rocks crystallize hundreds of degrees below the solidus. Um, so, you know, a little bit of future work here. I'll kind of rip through this pretty fast. Um, Craig also noted um, in this paper we talked about thermal migration model, so you can have um, stable isotope fractionation if you just take the bulk SiO2 content of these granites. Um, so, you know, Corliss and I haven't done it yet, but we're going to start working on kind of looking at stable isotope uh, fractionation in, in these granitic rocks to try to see if we can see any of these low temperature stuff. Um, another thing that I'm actively working on, this is that titanite crystal I showed earlier. You know, we've got all of these beautiful chemical gradients here, and these chemical gradients are just um, full of diffusion and kinetic information. So um, what we're going to be doing is starting to do some diffusion modeling on titanites because we have some really good constraints on the diffusivity of different elements in titanite, which will allow us to put even more constraints on the crystallization temperatures and cooling histories. Um, hopefully working on this with Bjorn soon. Um, you know, there's basically just a paucity of any experimental data on these kinds of compositions under these um, environments. So pretty much the only person who's done anything like this would be Bjorn working in hydrothermal diamond anvil cells. So we're going to try to do some work on silicates, water, um, miscibility, and solubility in, in hydrothermal diamond anvil cells. Um, and um, Simone and I have been talking a lot about this recently. Um, you know, there are some pretty important implications. If you have a granite sitting at 500 degrees Celsius um, and hydrothermal and pop porphyry copper deposits sitting directly above this that are also could be con crystallizing at these low temperatures, you know, there's, a, there's room for um, interdisciplinary collaboration, I guess, um, in this material. Um, so just to conclude, um, again, multiple lines of evidence from these rocks demonstrate that the quartz, the feldspars, you know, I didn't even get into the amphiboles. They record low temperatures. Um, these rocks crystallize hundreds of degrees below the solidus. Um, and I think in the future, we're going to need more observations from other natural systems. This is just one plutonic system from one tectonic setting. Um, other lines of evidence, you know, if we go into the literature and look at titanium quartz values that have been reported, um, they also kind of get these low titanium concentrations. So I, I, I'm interested to see how pervasive these low temperature phenomenon are. Um, and with that, uh, I'll just say thank you. Yeah, it's very sensitive to titanium activity. Yeah, so that was, I mean, that was, uh, well, that was one of the main reasons I did the um, diffusion modeling in the first place, just for, uh, of, of exactly that factor. You know, if you have, um, so this is that figure I showed earlier with the solidus. You know, in order to get titanium concentrations this low, um, you need to have, at, at these pressures, you need to have titanium activities of around 0.1 or maybe 0.2 to 0.1, which is significantly lower, but I, I would not discount that possibility. Um, but even if that's the case, um, the diffusion the, the diffusion model suggests that these things cannot be crystallizing from high temperatures because you know that that's completely independent of titanium activity. This is just titanium concentrations and quartz crystals relaxing the diffusion profile. Um, and I cannot do it no matter how much I turn the dials. I cannot get those concentration profiles um, to match crystallization from a magmatic temperature. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
I'm stuck on it too. But, but again, that's why the, the modeling is completely independent of limited diffusion, limited supply of titanium to this poor schematic interface. It doesn't rely on that at all. Matter. Steve? Yeah, I mean, uh, my initial thought is that it's easier to reconcile these low temperatures with, you know, localized, you know, phenomena. So, um, yeah, so maybe more, I mean, it happens throughout the entire intrusive sweep, um, but that's not to say it's all happening at the same time. You know, it could be, you know, very locally, uh, it could be very regional to an individual plutonic body, you know. The Cathedral Peak is an extreme example because those quartz and feldspar crystals were clearly experiencing a lot of thermal pulsing on just a, that, that small scale. I mean, you get these case bar megacrysts that are about this big. Um, so I th regional, very local, localized, low temperature phenomena happening pervasively across the entire sweep for 10 millions of years seems like the most reasonable model explanation to me at this point, as opposed to the whole system undergoing it. And, and, and the zircon crystallization ages may indicate that that's the case. According to Danielle, not at all. Not at all. Um, yeah. It, yes, I, I, I did. It's basically returning the same data. I mean, you know, you know, this is why I wanted to go to Titanite because um, I've got multiple known diffusivities, so I could actually do quarter rim stuff to look at magma residence time. But you know, to your to your question about the um, differences in diffusivity, if you go back to that crystal, you know, I guess you know if you would expect differences in the diffu diffusivity uh, along different crystallographic axes, that you know, this might look a little, you know, diffusion along this crystal face might be a bit different than, than that one. That might be one way to look for it, but experimentally, from Danielle's work, the titanium diffusion is completely isotropic. Or isotropic. <laughs> okay. Well, I wouldn't think it's probably the supply of, well, so th I think you're seeing, so these concentration gradients are, um, I think the titanium concentration is a passive indicator. What's driving this is quartz crystallization and the titanium just kind of getting caught up in that. Um, so, you know, it could be a number of things. It's crystallization. So if you start, you know, for example, if you, st you dissolve the crystal here, either by changing the composition of the fluid or increasing the temperature, you're gonna decrease the solub solubility of quartz, dissolve some, and then start recrystallizing. You know, you can see maybe some evidence here where you have decreasing titanium concentration outward from the crystal. Um, that could be, what, like what Faye's saying, a limited supply of titanium to the quartz um, fluid interface. Um, but, but either way, I think the titanium concentrations are just kind of passively there when the quartz is crystallizing. But, but it could be, you know, it's it obviously changes in the solubility of quartz in the fluid from which it's crystallizing, whether that's pressure pulses, temperature pulses, compositional changes. It could be any number of those things. Donna? If we had fluid inclusions, that would be really nice. Um, no, there's no evidence for it. But um, this is why I'm saying that that thermal migration model is under construction. You know, there's basically just two experiments done on the thermal gradient. Um, but um, th an important observation that Craig made with those is that if you have a low volume, so maybe 5% or less per alkaline single phase fluid, um, the bulk composition of that material is still metaluminous. So the quartz and the feldspar is in that system. The bulk composition is still metaluminous, while the fluid from which they're crystallizing could be peralkaline. Um, 
It doesn't have to be for alkaline, um, but you know, so far as we know from experiments, really the only way to get these low temperatures um, is if you allow the alkali to aluminum ratio to vary, either per alkaline, per aluminous. But if you had a per aluminous fluid, you might expect to have some like phenols or aluminous sulfate forming or something. So, but no, I don't have any evidence for it. Craig, did you have a question? Yeah, um, so it's it's kind of a balance because, you know, the other place we were looking at is we're like, oh, great, let's go to the Lachlan Pole Belt, this classic uh, cyan classification granite. Um, the problem with those is that they formed really deep. So they formed at you know, six kilobars depth, whereas these formed at two kilobars. And so forming at er, four to six kilobars. So they formed much deeper, and that means that they were at higher temperatures for longer. So if you look at the quartz crystals from rocks like those, um, a lot of the um, titanium concentrations and everything have been completely smeared out, um, or they've been deformed. They're really, some of them are quite deformed. Uh, so it's kind of, a, you have to strike the right balance for rocks that can actually sustain these pretty pristine crystals without deformation or, you know, just metamorphic uh, reequilibration. Um, Bob Wiebe did, an ex did a study around 2007, right after the initial titanium and quartz calibration came out <coughs> on some A-types from New England, and he was getting the same concentration. Um, the difference is that he did that with the initial titanium and quartz calibration that was done at 10 kilobars, and it was later demonstrated that titanium solubility is very dependent on pressure. Um, so for that 10 kilobar experiment, for the 10 kilobar cal calibration curve, um, 20 to 40 ppm kind of actually fits this magmatic temperatures, but at much lower te much lower pressures, um, those temperatures drop significantly. Um, but that's really all that's been done so far. But uh, again, it's striking this balance between you know granites that have survived their path through the crust um, relatively undisturbed, and those that have just been mangled by metamorphism. Probably. <laughs> um, good question. I don't. I don't know. Um, it's pseudo sections and stuff. So you pick your cups of good coffee, really. Um. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, not really, but we know, so Jay Aggie did some work during, I think, his PhD or postdoc on these rocks from the Sierra Crest, you know, the, the northern Sierras where we're working in the southern Sierras, there's actually a, a barometric gradient. So the southern Sierra is crystallized at much deeper pressures um, than the northern Sierra. So you actually, there is this kind of independent evidence from the mineral mineralogy um, that suggests that this pressure gradient existed. Um, so within the minerals and the granites themselves, there's low pressures. So, you know, that pressure estimate is wishy-washy. But again, that curve is pretty insensitive to pressure. So it would have to be. The, the alternative would be that these rocks, instead of forming at two kilobars, had to form at six to eight kilobars, which would, you know, make people probably more upset than what I'm talking about, because that's much deeper than we thought possible. Although I, I would I would say you know from from that from that description that you're basically just overcoming kinetic barriers to crystallization from an amorphous silicate, right? So I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I brought this idea to Bjorn and he just kind of shrugged it off. He was like, yeah, that's that's 
perfectly fine this past work day. Um, <laughs> I was like stressing out about it for a couple months, and I went to Bjorn. I was like, oh my God, this thing's going to work. He's like, okay, it's fine. It's fine with me. So, you know, he, he's got no problem with it. Um, but, but again, that would be from that would be from your work with you know, systems where you have very purely administrative tasks and composition. Well, water rich. Comments? Yeah, that's yeah. That that was actually kind of what I was trying to do originally with this. It was like, you know, hey, maybe I can get like uplift rates on granite from these profiles. Um, with that, if you did, if you form those concentration gradients at the solidus, at high pressure, I mean, those things would have to go. They would have to cool. You know, pr I I could not, I couldn't bend the twist the knobs on my diffusion model high enough to get to that high of cooling rate. So, I mean, they would have to cool probably on the order of 600 degrees C per million years, and that's a pretty rapid uplift rate. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, we've got eclogites from, you know, Southeast Asia that came up to the surface in a million years, so it's possible. Um, but uh, I don't know. Fast. They'd have to come up very fast. <laughs> yeah, something like that. 